So, here is the definition. So, indirect analytic continuation or indirect analytic extension. So, it is this topic that is uh, which is which provides lot of variety and uh, gives you some new things ok. So, what is this indirect analytic continuation? So, so the idea is the following. So, what you do is uh, you have uh, so in the case of direct analytic continuation what happened is you had two domains which intersected and you had functions and analytic functions on these domains which agreed on the intersection ok. Now, what you do is that you do extend it from 2 to any finite number ok. You extend it from 2 to any finite number, but do not insist that uh, all the sets in your collection you do not insist that they all intersect, but you only insist that you know uh, if there is an ordering every member intersects with the next. So, what you do is you do something like this. So, uh, so you have do we have domains domains uh, so we have pairs suppose we have pairs uh, d alpha f alpha where d alpha are uh, are domains and f alpha from d alpha to c are analytic and an ordering uh, uh, a total ordering uh, of the set uh, a is equal to set of all alpha ok. So, you know you have a collection of pairs d alpha comma f alpha indexed by alpha running in an index set capital A all right and uh, these pair cons these pairs each of these pairs consists of a domain namely an open connected set and an analytic function on the domain right and on this set A you have a total order let A be finite let A be finite for simplicity ok. Uh, say A equal to alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha m ok. So, A is A is given like this ok and I put this strictly less than to say that there is a that is because of total ordering ok that is since there is a total order uh, uh, in fact if it is finite uh, then total order is always there all right. But the point is why I want the ordering is the following. So, the, the point I want is let for every i d sub alpha i intersects intersects with d sub alpha i plus 1 uh, and f alpha restricted to d sub alpha i intersection d sub alpha i plus 1 is equal to f alpha i plus 1 restricted to d alpha i intersection d alpha i plus 1 ok. So, suppose I have this situation right. In fact, I could have taken the set as 1 2 3 etcetera m and then I could have simply called it as d 1 d 2 etcetera d 1. I could have simply called these pairs as d 1 comma f 1 d 2 comma f 2 etcetera d m comma f m. You should have made it easier to write down but the reason why I am doing this is because uh, in practice uh, 
this parameterization could be even continuous not even discrete and I am going to think of it as uh, coming out of uh, path alright. So, but I am looking at only here I am only looking at the finite case. So, the situation is like this. So, the situation is uh, uh, so, so the diagram for this will look like this okay. So, you know the diagram will look like this. So, we have uhhh so here is d1 uh, so this is d alpha 1 uh, then I have this is d alpha 2 and they have a non trivial intersection here then well uhhh d, d alpha 3 may or may not intersect d alpha 1 but it has to intersect d alpha 2 so it will be something like this. So, here is the intersection and then you have something here which is d alpha 4 and so on and it goes on like this until I end up with d alpha m which has some intersection with the previous number okay. And what is happening is that I have uh, uh, I have I have a function f alpha 1 which is analytic on d alpha 1 with values in c and I have this function f alpha 2 which is analytic on d alpha 2 which is analytic uh, on d alpha 2 and it is complex valid function and on this intersection f alpha 1 and f alpha 2 uh, uh, they uh, so here it should be alpha i and this should be alpha i plus 1 right. Mm. And of course, I will have to take i from uh, 1 to m minus 1 for this to make sense. So, uh, so I have this situation. So, you can see what is happening uh, in other words what you are having is a chain of direct analytic continuations okay. Uh, we, we get a chain of direct analytic continuations so uh, d alpha 1 f alpha 1 d alpha m f alpha m. this is a chain of direct analytic continuations namely this uh, is a direct uh, the pair d alpha 2 f alpha 2 is a direct analytic continuation of d alpha 1 f alpha 1 okay. Then the pair d alpha 3 f alpha 3 is a direct analytic continuation of d alpha 2 f alpha 2 namely f alpha 3 and f alpha 2 will coincide on this intersection and this goes on all right. So, every uh, pair is a direct analytic continuation of the previous one okay and uh, it is also direct analytic continuation of the next one okay. So, you, you have a chain of direct analytic continuations and then what we say we say that the the function that you get at the end uh, uh, f alpha m we say that this uhhh d alpha m f alpha m we say it is an indirect analytic continuation of the first pair okay. And usually uh, the word indirect is something that I am stressing but if you see a uh, uh, general literature if you see general literature the word indirect is not mentioned. But I am stressing indirect because uh, in general it will be like this okay. Of course, if there are only two then it is there is no difference between direct and indirect okay. But uh, the reason for calling it indirect is something very uh, strange uh, what can happen is I can start with a pair okay I can have a chain okay such that the ending pair has the same domain as the starting pair okay but the function I get will be completely different. 
okay. So, this is a strange thing that can happen. What can happen is I can start with a pair here, I can have a chain, but the last member has the uh, domain the same as the first member, but the function is different such a thing can happen and you know what is uh, actually happening uh, in this case what is actually happening in this case is that these function elements the first one that you started with and the last one that you got which is again a function on the first piece okay these two are two branches of an analytic function they are they are different branches you arrive from one branch to another branch in this way okay that is the whole point you we saw in the previous lectures that you know if you have a general uh, analytic function if uh, you take if its derivative does not vanish at a point then in a neighborhood of that point it is it has an inverse which is also analytic all right that is the inverse function theorem it is 1 to 1 and uh, it has an inverse. But on the other hand if the derivative vanishes then it is a critical point, but even for the critical even at in a neighborhood of the critical point we have seen that you can get it branches of the inverse function they are functional inverses not actually inverses because in the neighborhood of the critical point it will be a many to one function okay it will behave like z going to z power m where m minus 1 is the order of the critical point and you will get m branches for the inverse function okay and these m branches will live on a Riemann surface as a single function. But the process of going from one branch to another branch if you do it locally that comes via indirect analytic continuation that is the importance of indirect analytic continuation. So, this indirect analytic continuation is something that helps you to find uh, all uh, helps you to exhaust all possible branches of a function okay and of course you remember you must understand that whenever you are trying to talk about branches of a function that function is certainly not uh, uh, it does have a uh, singular point and it has a branch cut and so on and so forth okay. So, uh, so that is the importance of uh, uh, indirect analytic continuation okay that is the motivation for the study of indirect analytic continuation, but this needs to be formalized using a proper theory. So, this is the first step you define what is meant by a chain of direct analytic continuations okay. Uh, we, we, we say that uh, uh, d alpha m f alpha m is an indirect analytic continuation continuation. the first one d alpha 1 f alpha 1 okay and uh, the point with uh, indirect analytic continuation let me again repeat and stress is that it if you start with a particular function and you do an indirect analytic continuation and assume you come back to the same domain you started with you will end up you could end up uh, and if you try hard enough you will always end up with all possible branches of that function. So, you can get all the branches of the function okay by this process okay that is the that is the importance of indirect analytic continuation. Uh, so, the word indirect is uh, usually omitted in in standard literature, but I am stressing it. So, uh, so let me let us let us formalize this. Let's formalize this. Uh, one would like to uh, uh, treat this uh, in two possible ways. There are the two possible ways of proceeding now, and I'll do both of them. The first one is trying to do it using power series. Okay. So, uh, so let me let us think of indirect analytic continuation uh, using power series. So, the idea is the following. So, uh, so let me write that down indirect analytic continuation uh, 
using power series. So, uh, basically what you are doing is uh, this means that you are trying to do indirect analytic continuation where your pairs d come d alpha f alpha they consist of uh, a domain and a power series which is convergent and represents an analytic function on that domain ok. So, you are trying to get a chain of direct analytic continuations of functions that are defined by power series let uh, f be analytic on uh, a domain t ok let f be analytic on a domain t right uh, and uh, so so i let me let me draw let me draw a picture so here is my complex plane and well here is my domain d and here is my function f okay and i can do the following thing if you give me a point z1 in the domain ok then the function f is analytic at z1 certainly because it is analytic on the whole domain, whole domain. Since it is ana analytic at z1 I can write out it is power series centered at z1 ok. So, the power series centered at z1 as you know will be uh, a power series which has certain radius of convergence ok and that radius of convergence uh, the function uh, the power series will represent the function f. Uh, uh, within that disc of convergence which is uh, the disc centered at z1 with radius equal to radius of convergence z1 uh, corresponding to uh, this power series, power series expansion. So, take take the Taylor expansion p f z1 at z1 of f with radius of convergence r of z1 ok. So, you know uh, you know what this uh, Taylor expansion is of course p f z1 uh, is uh, of z is jet is just you know sigma uh, n equal to 0 to infinity uh, uh, z minus z1 to the power of n by factorial n into f n of z1 where f n is the nth derivative of f. This is a this is a Taylor expansion. The Taylor expansion at the point uh, Taylor expansion centered at z1 is uh, given by this formula. Okay. This it's just expand expanding f in terms of a power series centered at z1, which means that you are expanding f in terms of powers of z minus z1, positive integral powers of z minus z1. Okay, that is the Taylor series of f. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the Taylor coefficients are given by the nth derivative. The nth Taylor coefficient is just the nth derivative evaluated at the at that point divided by factorial n, right? And r of z1, uh, r of z1 is the uh, is the radius of convergence of convergence of uh, of this of this power series this is it is a radius convergence ok. Of course, you know uh, uh, I want to look at the case uh, uh, I want to eliminate a silly case the silly case is when the radius of convergence is infinite ok. If the radius of convergence is infinite it means that f it extends to an entire function ok. Because if the radius of convergence is infinite it means the disc of convergence is a whole complex plane it is a it is a disc centered at z1 
infinite radius. So the whole complex plane is contained. And uh, if you take the that analytic function, that will be a maximal extension of this pair d comma f, and that maximal extension is entire. So actually, this f is restriction of an entire function, and there is nothing special about it. Okay, trying to extend an analytic function is serious only for analytic functions which have singularities. So why do you try to extend an analytic function? You try to extend an analytic function just to discover where it could have singularities where it could have branch points and so on. But if the function is entire there is nothing to check it is it extends to a unique analytic function on the whole plane and the story is over but we are not interested in that okay. So I am going to only consider the situation where the radius of convergence is finite okay assume uh, f does not extend to an entire function. So the radius of convergence is always uh, finite uh, for every uh, z1 in t. So you have that means you are considering a function which has only finite radius of convergence okay. So so the, so the picture is like this see if you give me z1 then there is some there is some finite disc surrounding z1 with radius equal to radius of uh, convergence r of z1 okay. Now uh, the first key point that is very important to this formulation of indirect analytic continuation with respect to power series using power series is the fact that you know if I now vary this z1 okay I vary this z1 after all z1 could have been any point in t if I vary this z1 then of course these disks of convergence will vary and the radius the, the corresponding radii of convergence will also vary but the key point is this variation in the radius of convergence is continuous okay. So, so here is a fact so here is a lemma <coughs> uh, rz rz1 is continuous in z1 belonging to d okay mind you I could have I could have used the variable point as z but if I use the variable point of z I have to put a different variable for the variable of this power series okay mind you that this power series will coincide with f of z on d intersection this radius of convergence. I mean the d intersection this disc of convergence. So you must understand that uh, uh, <coughs> uh, so let me write that note p of f z1 of z is equal to f of z on d intersection mod z minus uh, z1 strictly less than r z1. this is of course going to be true the this if you take the analytic function defined by this power series and you inter and look at the intersection of this disk of convergence with the original domain you started with there it will give back the function f because after all you know that the taylor series of a function converges to a func to that function at every uh, at every point in the disk of con uh, at every point in the domain of the function okay where it is analytic okay. So this Taylor series uh, this function p f z1 as an analytic function is just f when you take the intersection of the disk of uh, convergence and the original domain right. In other words I am just saying that this is a direct analytic continuation of f it is a direct analytic continuation of f okay uh, but the point is that this rz1 is uh, a continuous function of z1 and uh, 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 so uh, okay perhaps this looks a little too cramped is continuous in the variable 
z1 belonging to d. In fact, for z1 comma z2 in d, modulus of rz1 minus rz2 is uh, strictly lesser than uh, is less than or equal to mod z1 minus. Z2. In fact, this is the this is the equation. The equation is uh, r of z1 minus rz2 is less than or equal to mod z1 minus z2. Okay. The moment you have something like this, you can see very clearly that r is a uh, continuous function because uh, given an epsilon positive. Okay. Uh, if I fix z1, if I fix as if I fix z1 and make z2 variable, and if I give epsilon given an epsilon positive how will I make mod r z1 minus r z2 less than epsilon I just have to make mod z1 minus z2 less than epsilon. So I will have to choose delta equal to epsilon in the epsilon delta definition of continuity of r okay. So I can simply choose given epsilon I can simply choose delta equal to epsilon. So this this inequality tells you that uh, uh, trivially uh, the function r is uh, continuous according to the epsilon delta definition of continuity okay and how does this come about this simply comes about by properties of uh, uh, the uh, disc of convergence and radius of convergence see so let me quickly indicate uh, the, the proof of that proof so you know the, the uh, uh, so let me draw a diagram. So I have situation like this. So I have this D. So here is my Z1, and say I have Z2, and uh, uh, I have I have this uh, disk of convergence at Z1 with radius of convergence RZ1. So you know I have some disk like this. Okay, uh, and then with Z2 I have another disk. And well, this this length is R Z one. Uh, that length is R Z two. Okay, and well, you know, if I draw this this radius, this radial line for the for the disc centered at Z one, then you know that uh, uh, this is R Z one, this is R Z two, and uh, this distance is mod Z one minus Z two. Okay, and uh, we, we need to show what do you need to show to show this inequality? You will have to show that uh, r modulus of r z one, uh, that is r z one, lies between uh, r z two plus modulus of z one minus z two and r z two minus of mod z one minus z. This is what you'll have to show, right? This is what you'll have to show, all right? And I'll just explain why uh, why this is true. It's enough to prove this because if you prove this by interchanging the roles of Z1 and Z2 by symmetry, you'll also get the other inequality. So you will have to just understand why this is true, okay? And uh, uh, why is this true? Because if you contradict it, you'll get a contradiction. So uh, if this is not true if not true what you will get is you will get rz1 is greater than rz2 plus modulus of z1 minus z2 this is what you will get all right and uh, I claim that this uh, this is a contradiction this will give a contradiction to the properties of uh, uh, the uh, the so called radial symmetry of uh, the radial symmetry property of convergence. Okay. So I will I will just have to use the fact that you know if a power series has finite radius of convergence then on the circle of convergence certainly there is at least one point where it will uh, where the corresponding uh, function will have a singularity okay. See 
the proof of this claim is suppose at every point on the circle of convergence suppose you can extend directly analytically the function to an analytic function then what you are saying is that uh, the analytic function itself extends to a disk which contains the circle of convergence okay and that is the contradiction to the property of radius of convergence the property of radius of convergence is that inside the disk of convergence uh, uh, the power series will converge on the boundary you cannot say anything but outside the boundary it has to diverge that is the property of radius of convergence the radius of convergence is the smallest such number such that you know uh, I mean it, uh, I mean it is it is a number with the property it is a unique number with the property that inside the circle of convergence the function uh, the uh, the function I mean the power series uh, converges outside it diverges you cannot say anything on the circle of convergence but from this definition it follows that if at every point on the circle of convergence you can directly analytically extend the function then this function is uh, analytic on the whole uh, it will be analytic on a bigger set than the disk of convergence and that is not allowed on a bigger open set or on a bigger open disk than the disk of convergence which will include the circle of convergence and that is not allowed because outside the circle of convergence the power series is supposed to diverge that is a property of the radius of convergence. So, if this is the case then what will happen is that this uh, this uh, this circle centered at z 1 radius r z 1 will certainly contain the 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 uh, the circle centered at z2 with radius rz2 right this is what will happen you see this distance is mod z1 minus z2 okay this distance is mod z1 minus z2 uh, so if i draw it like this this is mod z1 minus z2 and this remaining distance is r z2 okay so this distance is mod z1 minus z2 this remaining this distance is rz2 their sum is rz2 plus mod z1 minus z2 okay. So, this sum is rz2 plus mod z1 minus z2 and if rz1 is greater than that okay then it means that this this bigger disc the disc centered at z1 radius rz1 contains this smaller disc okay. But then it means that the analytic function uh, the power series centered at z2 that analytic function extends beyond the uh, circle of convergence which it should not okay do you do you understand that so so let me write that down uh, and that will give you the proof uh, this will this would mean that the di the, the disk of convergence Uh, mod z minus z2 less than r z2 uh, is contained in uh, of the power series of f centered at z2 is contained in the disk of convergence. mod z minus uh, z 1 less than r z 1 implying that uh, the analytic function uh, p f z 2 extends to the circle of convergence mod z minus z2 is equal to rz2 a contradiction and that finishes the proof okay that finishes the proof okay so if you contradict this inequality what will happen is that one of the disks lies inside the other okay 
and then it will tell you that the power series in the smaller disc is extendable to an analytic function even on the boundary of the smaller disc, but that is not supposed to happen. If an analytic function if you take the analytic function defined by a power series and if it has finite radius of convergence then on the circle of convergence there has to be at least one singularity ok. That is because the circle of convergence is supposed to be defined uniquely as the circle inside which the power series will converge always and outside which the power series will always diverge ok. So, the fact is that that property tells you that you get this inequality and if you interchange z1 and z2 in this inequality by symmetry you get this inequality and both put together you get this inequality and this inequality tells you that the radius of convergence at each point uh, is a continuous function on the domain ok. And this lemma is the crucial uh, starting point to define uh, and to treat analytic continuation using power series ok. So, I uh, uh, armed with this lemma I can make definitions and I will do that in the next lecture.